This is Marshall Masters for Yowza.com. That's Y-O-W-U-S-A.com. And today we're going to cut to the chase with Gerald Clark. Well, hey there, Yowza subscribers and listeners at large. Today we're going to have a fun interview with Gerald Clark, and he's another Planet X researcher, author of several books on the Anunnaki, and we're going to talk shop. Now, for those of you who are novices, I'd suggest you start off with my Planet X 101 series to come up to speed, because this will be a little more of an advanced conversation. But for you old salty dogs out there, Folks that been to a county fair and heck even once made it to the county seat, yeah, you're just going to love it because we're going to get into the big question. I call it the frogs, you know, the folks that sit there and go, when, when, when. <laughs> and he posted a video on YouTube and I think it's really great. He did a superb analysis of the Harrington orbit as it appears in the 1992 documentary with Zachariah Sitchin, Are We Alone in the Universe? That was a monumental documentary. It had a huge impact on the lives of both men. And then we're going to talk about what we think about the Anunnaki and about surviving what is to come. Along the way, I'm also going to talk about survival relocation. Specifically for those of you who are paralyzed. You're like the proverbial deer in the headlights. You just can't bust a move for one reason or another. Many of you just think, well, it's hopeless. If I can't afford beans, bullets, and bunkers, what am I supposed to do? Well, what you don't understand is that you already possess the most valuable survival tool of all. It's so valuable that the elites have gone to great lengths to program you and your loved ones for failure. And if you decide to take back your personal power as a human being and an individual, from that point on, you will have hope for the future as you take small, considered steps in the right direction. So with that, let's get into it with Gerald Clark. This is Marshall, and I'm on with Gerald Clark. And Gerald, welcome to Cut to the Chase. It's really great to be here, Marshall. A uh, warm welcome to you and all your listening audience. And the same to your listening audience. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you're very much welcome. And so we're a couple of guys, and we have the same interest in the same topic. And what I want to start off with is a video you put up on May 31st, 2016, titled... Nibiru and Earth Changes Updates, Are We Close?, with Gerald Clark, which has done pretty well and seems to have a good ratio of thumbs up to thumbs down. This was something that came to my attention vis-a-vis -vis my audience, and they were really impressed with your analysis of the timing on all of this. So why don't you just summarize that and then Let's get into an analysis of the findings. Okay. Well, I know how familiar you are with uh, Dr. Harrington's work. And I was very familiar with it, too. In my first book, when I wrote The Anunnaki of Nibiru in 2013, I used some tra past transit dates as a historical reference point and projected slightly forward, said, well, it's not anywhere close. So I didn't, I didn't really spend much attention on it because I was so focused on what the Anunnaki did in terms of our genetic enslavement, that I didn't get too concerned so much about, well, <laughs> where's Nibiru right now? Well, after time, a lot of people kept bringing this up, and I got drawn into doing an analysis. And I, and I thought to myself, well, where would I start? Well, as a scientist, I'm going to start the best I can with data, but I'm also going to take into account 
cultural occurrences, things from history, but I'm not going to defer to them over actual data from a scientific instrument. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So I'm going to synthesize that. And I, and I did that. Well, starting with uh, Dr. Harrington's work, um, the most impressive point in history to me was when the author, Zechariah Sitchin, went to the United States Naval Observatory uh, with a video crew, and uh, apparently with Harrington's cooperation, Dr. Harrington, and him being the chief observer, uh, uh, scientist at the Naval Observatory, this was a pretty big uh, encounter, especially the kind of stuff they were talking about. We know in 1981, Harrington and Neugebauer were the two key figures when data was released about possibly finding the Nibiru complex or Planet X or whatever you want to call it, um, using the infrared astronomical scope. So that was in the papers, uh, and I focused on what Dr. Harrington said there and also what he said when he met with Zechariah Sitchin and what he showed us. So it's just as important what he showed us as what he said. So let's just summarize what happened. In 1981 in the paper, this, these scientists who apparently didn't have a bridle on their mouths were, were releasing information about data from, an, from this astronomical scope that was commissioned to find something for since the turn of the century, which is the perturber of Neptune and Uranus. And we have scientific evidence that this is not just a theory, it actually is happening. So using that, in 1981, Dr. Harrington said something that contradicted what Dr. Neugebauer said, and he said, I believe it's five billion miles outside of Pluto, whereas Dr. Neugebauer said, and he was at JPL and Caltech on the West Coast, said, I believe it's 50 billion miles away and it's not going anywhere. So he was, he was tapping out the fear. I mean, unless he had a blink test, how could he say that, first of all? you know, that it's not moving. So I, I saw some disparities in the data they were reporting, and it really made my hackles go up a little bit. I realized that after 93, with Harrington dead, he had his mouth shut. I think Harrington was assassinated after he did that interview with Sitchin. That's my personal feeling. He crossed the line. I agree. I agree. So anyway, but he gave us two pieces of important data that I think he was trying to release without doing it obviously. Well, the first one that showed up in the paper, and you know after that, it, everything went silent. Well, in 1990, on August 30th of 1990, he met with Sitchin and did this video that's still on my YouTube playlist today. I can't believe it's still up. Not that I'm inviting anyone to take it down, but, <laughs> but uh, what he showed us in there was an orbital chart where he thought Nibiru was coincident with where, New, where Zechariah Sitchin was. So they were there to confer about exactly what we're talking about right now, is where's the damn thing and when's it coming in? Well, based on that meeting, um, he showed us this chart, and with a little simple linear analysis, if you assume the chart was to scale, it turned out to be 6.6 .6 billion miles uh, from the sun, which is 3. Uh, something billion miles outside of Pluto. Well, this is less than what he said before. Okay, so I ended up with two numbers, decided to do my own blink test, and then compare it with the mathematics where I was playing around in a Nibiru orbital report I did last year, because I ended up with a table that approximated when it should arrive based on some scalar factors on the velocity. So this, this second show that, I, that I'm just talking to you about um, I decided to take those blink points and then see what that velocity was, which actually quite shocked me. So I had something to compare it with because we, if we assumed 50 billion miles for aphelion and we knew it was an 1800 miles the in and out according to the Sumerian records, then we had a, we had a long axis where we could calculate the distance equals rate times time. So the average velocity, if you do that, comes out to 3,170 miles per hour. That's point to point, perihelion, or aphelion to perihelion, okay? But we know quite well that comets don't travel that way. They don't travel one velocity. The velocity out uh, toward its binary star is going to be much slower than it is when it gets to the uh, inner sun. And we know, so, so depending on the mass and a few other factors, you can determine how fast it would be traveling based on its elliptical orbit. But there's so, there's so many parameters that it ends up being guesswork. 
And I tried to do this in a uh, report where I looked at a, a scientific report that had used the classic Newtonian equations for, you know, the tetherball theory of gravity and the big G and the little G and calculate this. And, uh, and it didn't come out in the window that I thought was acceptable, but I thought it was great work. Okay. So these two blink points, when I used them, I started out with 5 billion miles outside of Pluto, which is 8.67 billion miles. And then uh, in 1990, August, with Sitchin, he showed us this chart. And like I told you, it looked like it was 6.6 .6 billion miles, if that chart was to scale. And I believe it was. What's your opinion on that, uh, Marshall? You've seen that diagram multiple times. I know you have. Did, you, did it ever occur to you to ask, is it to scale? That's always a good question. You don't see a scale there. But interestingly enough, Carlos Ferrada, the astronomer who first announced Nibiru back in 1940. Mm -hmm. I've read his work. Paired a similar diagram, and it was pretty much in line with each other. Yeah, I, I did not do a linear analysis on his chart, even though I just saw it recently. But he actually published what he said the Herculobus aphelion distance was, and he believed it was 32 billion miles. In the big scheme of things, it's not that far off if it was truly at 50 billion. Maybe it was one of the planets in Nibiru that was at 32 while it was at 50. It's hard to say. It is really, really hard to say. I mean, for me, when I look at all of this, I see a comet-like orbit. There's a plate that the Sumerians did. And you look at that, and what the Sumerians are showing you is the things incline 10 degrees to the ecliptic. So there's quite a bit you can piece together with it. But I guess for me, it really comes down to what's happening to our sun, what's happening to our planet. Mm -hmm. That drives my work more than anything else. I liked your analysis and how you were breaking it down. Do you want me to finish it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. I like the way you broke it down in that video. Yeah, well, so I ended up with these two blink points that I really wanted people to think about and decide, you know, that's where the truth is or a lie is. And we can't truly know that unless you had access to what Neugebauer and Harrington were seeing directly. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I had to somewhat operate on faith that Harrington was telling the truth. And from what I could tell, and reading his papers and knowing lots of scientists. I spent years in that space. He seemed like an honorable guy to me. And, and a lot of times that's, that's the best you can do and then see if the data resonates true with you with a lot of uh, trust and verify, right? Well, I'll tell you, I've talked to some whistleblowers that had met him and knew him. They said the guy was the real deal. Mm -hmm. As far as they were concerned, they clipped him. Well, I don't think Sitchin would have gone to him unless he'd have believed he was the real deal. I had a chance to work with Sitchin a few times when he was alive, and that man dotted his I's and crossed his T's. We did an article in 2003. I know. I heard your discussion of that. He was amazingly detailed for anybody to be picking him apart academically from the couch, <laughs> not in the arena like he was. Wow. Oh, man. And, you know, Lloyd Pye, as far as I'm concerned, said it better than just about any of his defense of Sitchin. And you brought that up in one of your videos. I actually had it on my website for a while. Uh -huh. But the reality is he's in 23 plus different languages. Uh, his stuff's all over the world. And it's been out since 1976. And people have stood on his shoulders to get to where they are. So to kick a man that's dead as a hero to try to puff yourself up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say you and I are standing on his shoulders. Definitely. And I gave him acknowledgement in my book for doing that. You know, whether he was completely right or wrong on everything, nobody's right on everything. I agree. You know, it's not about being right. It's about getting it right. If you do it with integrity, eventually you'll get there. I absolutely agree, you know. But I see folks coming in and publishing in the field, and they just have all kinds of self-interested agendas. They're really not interested in doing good science or trying to do good science. And that makes them pretty dangerous people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to close out this number part so we can move on to... Yeah, let's do that. So we have two numbers, one back in um, 1981 when it was released, which is 8.67 billion miles. That's how far Harrington said it was at that time. 
No. Right. There was some variability possibly in which month that data was derived in anticipation of that news article released it. I don't know what that time frame is. Uh, one of my subscribers thinks it was three months, but I have no way. I don't really know. Right. So getting the data from the satellite and then getting it to the newspaper, um, I think Harrington, being an honest guy, would probably have given him an accurate estimation when he spoke. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, come on. He had a telescope specially designed and sent to New Zealand. He was looking for this thing, published a paper. Oh, I know. No. And you go back there. We had an article on our site about mainstream media coverage. And frankly, between you and me, what got that poor man killed was an afterthought in Sitchin's video at the very end of the video. Because you could see where a producer, this information came in just like a tail end Charlie and said, ooh, 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 too good not to use it, put it in there, where NASA had confirmed what these two guys are really saying in the video. That is, in my opinion, is what took it over the top. They clipped him, and then you pointed it out. Mm -hmm. Same on our site. Mm -hmm. Mainstream media coverage, right after he was assassinated, boom, it just went off a cliff. Oh, yeah. From 1993 forward, it was silenced. Yeah, it was terrible. And uh, not only silent, and then they came out with all of the contra anti Planet X theories. Mm -hmm. You know, you could tell that there was a real nasty cover up. Mm -hmm. so, so we got the second number from that interview that was so fantastic. So now we've got a 8.67 billion and 6 billion. I thought. Anyway, you subtract those. You get a delta of 2.01 billion miles. Uh -huh. From that, because we had the time, and it was, a, it was approximately nine years, you can calculate the velocity at that point in 1990 was 25,494 miles an hour. Uh -huh. I just told you in the first report I did, when I did the calculations, I came out with 3,170 miles an hour, which would be the average velocity. Okay, and then during the transit, during the middle, when it's in the middle between perihelion and aphelion, it probably travels approximately the average velocity from what most people note about cometary travel. So if you compare that velocity with 25,000 miles per hour, you're talking about an 8x increase from its average velocity to that speed. Well, that would indicate it's starting to experience a gravitational pull from the sun, and it's accelerating, and we know that's what they do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and they either gain enough speed to go into perihelion with the sun and, be, and either escape the sun's pull, and so they have to increase their velocity by at least a factor of two beyond what they are right there, or they get pulled into the sun. All right. So... The last blink I had was August of 1990 that gave me that number. If we had another number, we could do two things with that. We could update the velocity since 1990, because it certainly didn't slow down. It probably just sped up some more until it gets close. So determining exactly when it will arrive. When you were looking at, and he was on the perihelion leg where you're analyzing this, what do you think was happening around the semi-minor axis? In other words, the semi-minor axis of that orbit, mm -hmm. halfway point, mm -hmm. in terms of velocity, what do you think on the inbound, mm -hmm. where do you think the velocity were really taking a difference? I believe it probably really started accelerating beyond its average velocity, probably when it got past Pluto, would be my guess. And then by the time it made it to the asteroid, if it make, made it to the asteroid belt, I think it would really start to approach its terminal velocity. And then it, when it gets slung shot around the sun, of course, it's going to be much faster. So when I was playing around with the numbers in my first report, I was guessing if it was to be this fast and it'd be at 6.6 .6 billion miles away from the sun, just like Harrington showed on his chart, then how long would it take to get here? Well, if it didn't change speed, in my last report, I showed it would take, uh, I think it was 29.4 something years. Right. Well, if you add that to 1990, it lands you at uh, 2019. Right. But you and I both know <laughs> that it's going to speed up some more. So. Oh, yeah. Pedal to the metal. The really missing link of, you know, adjusting a, a small window. It could get smaller, but it was still small enough where 
I think you and I both realize it's real. We probably ought to be doing something. Absolutely. And there's something always in the back of my mind. What tells us with absolute certainty, because this is an object such as we've never seen in the skies, at least not in our memory, in our history. I mean, it's well documented in the Colburn Bible and elsewhere. Sure. But always in the back of my mind is, where does it say it has to follow our rules of physics? Well, <laughs> that's a very good question. Imagine they had used some sort of device around their planet to shield radiation when they got in close, maybe even a Dyson sphere so they could control its visibility in, in different wavelengths. Who knows? Bob Dean brought up that mm -hmm. as a possibility. That's where he did that in 2008, I think, in an interview. And uh, that could be, you know, a game changer and everything. But on the other hand, and you're right, Kozai mechanism tells us that anything in a bizarre orbit like this is going to either be flung out into deep space or it is going to slam into the sun. And we're looking at 3979, which according to Nostradamus is when the sun is just going to completely roast the earth and that's the end of life on the earth. Mm. And we've seen this with major comets where on the way out on their aphelion legs passing by Jupiter that their orbital durations are dramatically shortened. Hale Bopp was a classic, was a 40% reduction. It's a big difference. So I actually looked at, I was looking at one comet trying to figure this out, you know, how fast do they travel at aphelion, how travel, how, you know, as they circle around, how, how fast at perihelion. And I saw factors of up to 20x difference. Yeah. So I didn't feel uncomfortable about using a scalar factor of approximately eight, which brought us in. If you So between seven and eight, it landed between 2015 and 2017, about the middle of 2015. It was like halfway through the year. So that's what I put in my report. I was like, the best I can do until I get more data. In going through that, I thought you did a really good job on you know, taking into account all the variables and the assumptions, oh, I face it, you know, you and I, we're like little mice. We feed on the crumbs that fall off the table. Well, I know, and I feel like that sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's so heavily controlled. You know, the first law of Nibiru research, anything good disappears fast. <laughs> That's the way it goes. But your calculation of 2017 in... 2008, Bob Dean, and I've spoken with Bob Dean not long after that. And we had a conversation, I confirmed with him, and we talked about how he came across the information. But he was saying, 2017, take it to the bank. Well, I had officially the end of 2016. But the last number I saw, one of my subscribers ran through the math, went and looked back in 1981 to see if he could get a you know, a more monthly refinement instead of just a yearly refinement. And he did that, and, he, and it ended up moving it out to the first quarter of 2017. It was 2017.25, so it was a quarter of uh, the first part of the year. Now, you know, when you're down to this level of playing with fractions, I'm not sure we want to wallow in uh, finding out exactly what day it shows up. I think uh, <laughs> determining how we is. Um, primitive workers on this planet caught up in a holographic reality are going to respond to the simulator masters is really what's on my mind. <laughs> so I think we're going to do that in the third segment, but uh, we're just kind of going over the data right now. But uh, So there it is. And the other thing I wanted to throw in on this uh, Harrington report, apparently when he went to Black Birch, New Zealand to get this data point right after meeting with Sitchin, you know, he went down there in 1991. He had an 8-inch scope. Only an 8-inch scope. Think about that. An 8-inch scope. I had an 8-inch, you know, a Schmidt cast scope. Uh-huh. Barely, you know, make out artifices on the moon really well. So he was using this to look at something coming in, what he believed to be in the constellation Libra, from nearly the Antarctic in, in New Zealand. That's right. Well, I found out in one of his reports, he wasn't there to get a, just another blink point. He was looking for its location 
to get a visual on it so that he could adjust its inbound path. So if you have two points, you can get the velocity. If you have three, you can kind of draw the, the arc of the elliptical curve. And I think that's what he was there for. I agree. Just think about this, Marshall. If he was there with that small of a scope, and he was down looking in the south where the IRS data pointed that it was coming. And he told Sitchin he thought it was coming in through Libra. Right. Well, if he was down there looking to the south with his small scope, if he was able to get something that corroborated his orbital path, updates or his femoral models, I think that's part of why he died as well. Yeah. They always had the possibility like, well, it's coming in, but it's going to be so far away from us, you'll never see it. Right. <laughs> Like Planet Nine, mm -hmm. Caltech is. If somebody asked me how far away is Planet Nine, I'd just say a long, long time ago in a <laughs> galaxy far, far away. By the way, my kid just graduated from there with a with a, a, a scientific technical degree after being there for four or five years. <laughs> uh oh, he's just now graduating this spring. So when Dad and Son get together, does he roll his eyes? <laughs> you know, I have not been very successful in getting my kids to assimilate this data. They've been exposed to it. They know I've sent them signed copies of both my books, but they're not, you know, they're, they're 21 and 22. They're involved in the, finding their way in the simulator and this stuff just, it hasn't reached out and grabbed them. They're probably still invincible, just like you and I felt when we were that age. Yeah, you got a point there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, cool. Well, listen, in the next segment, when we come back, let's talk about the Anunnaki. <laughs> okay, we'll talk soon. Then. <laughs> This year, I changed my survival relocation program from groups to individuals because the window of opportunity is closing. For a lot of you who think that, just wait until it's up in the sky so that everybody can see it, even the ones that have been mocking and ridiculing you, that that will be the time when you can finally do something. Uh-uh. When that happens, you are going to be out of options. And the only thing you could really do at that point, do not tell anybody about your awareness. You do that, and panicky people will take it out on you, and you will die badly. Very, very badly. But on the other hand, there are the concerns. You do not know where to relocate to. Your family and friends mock and ridicule you. You cannot afford to build a bunker. You cannot bear to leave your grandchildren in harm's way, and well, you just have no hope for the future. Well, I'm here to tell you that there are answers to all of these questions and issues. We're not talking about waving a magic wand and saying supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. This is going to make it all better. No, you're going to have to take constructive steps. But there are things that you can do, no matter how much money you have in the bank. In fact, the less you have, the more options you will have. So, check out my personal relocation webinar program. And if you're ready to get off the dime and take the future in hand, I'm here in service to you. Now, let's get back to it with Gerald Clark. This is Marshall. I'm back on with Gerald. And in this segment, we're going to talk about the Anunnaki. By the way, Gerald, you know I just learned the Chinese term for the Anunnaki? You did? Yeah. Frucky rassholes. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I just heard, just heard uh, what the hillbilly response is going to be to the Buru coming. Nah, mama stay at home and uh, sit in my rocking chair and watch her come in. <laughs> <laughs> Must <Mustang. laughs> yeah, yeah, the Anunnaki. I mean, they really remind me of that classic joke. 
you know you're a redneck if you go to family reunions to pick up women. <laughs> Seems like that's what they like to do. They got this thing for Earth Girls, huh? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it's funny when I started talking, when I started writing my first book in 2004, uh, I had been doing this, I don't know, clandestine hobby, if you will. I was a vice president of engineering in a high tech startup company, and this was not something I had talked about at work at all, <laughs> <laughs> ever. But I was a truth seeker, you know, and uh, I had done uh, evolutionary hardware in college as my PhD uh, research focus where, you know, I was looking at different genetic algorithms and all the different ways that the simulator could work such that this evolutionary theory could be tested. Well, it turns out we had a software mechanism that they'd been doing it for a while in the AI community and the cognitive science community as well. Mm -hmm. Cog sci people were doing most of the data mining to set up rule sets and heuristics for an autonomous agent to be able to navigate its environment using situation assessment like humans do, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the AI community was working with the DoD, was looking to put it into drones, the Predator drone, and all the other different <laughs> vessels that they're, yeah, there's a man in the loop on them, but uh, they're moving them toward the point where there probably won't have to be. So anyway, I got, I got exposed to all that while I was an engineer. Well, well so one of the things that you brought up I just wanted to do for fun before we get back on the Anunnaki, I was building a six degree of freedom simulator that with and I'll just say that it was with DARPA through the Rotorcraft Pilots Associate. Since I was a chopper pilot, they kind of were picking my brain on setting up the rule sets for a program that was going to run a, an aircraft through a simulator and have it exposed to all kinds of threats and see if you can get it to respond the way a pilot would. That was the, kind of the point of the thing. Well, during that process, I realized there's all these external entities of interest, if you will, that uh, we, we had labeled them because, you know, an SA-7 would be a lot more interesting than a, a telephone pole, Yeah. you know, in terms of a threat. So I started asking myself and had to, ask, and had to teach in the simulation, what is interesting in the environment? And from a pilot's standpoint, what's interesting is accomplishing your mission in accordance with your mission parameters and staying alive, right? right? Well, if you generalize that to a human, what they look at and go, oh, that's interesting, or this is interesting, and just kind of generalize from a evolution of consciousness and survival standpoint that's coaching or shaping their situation awareness, then all of a sudden you realize what's interesting to a person has a lot to do with their fate and their destiny and their path. Because what they're paying attention to, if you pay attention to what you're paying attention to, you might see that pattern. And so I kind of got a life lesson about what's interesting. <laughs> so I started paying attention to what I was paying attention to. What was, why was I interested in the Anunnaki, for instance? You know, I don't know. They seem to have had one of the earliest languages and told stories about their cosmogony that was so scientific, I'd never read anything like that before. Uh -huh. and, that, and I'm referring to the Enuma Elish. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Harrington had read that as well. And so he was aware of the concept of an intruder planet that would have been trapped into our solar system that could have been the, the intruder, the perturber that caused Neptune and Uranus to tilt on their orbital axis relative to the solar ecliptic. Right? So it was pretty scientific. And I'm, I'm reading this, reading the Enuma Elish about the Anunnaki's story and realizing that a lot of this scientists has corroborated. And then I looked, and, and so for several years from 2004 until 2013, when I finally released the book, I had scads of, I had so much information, I didn't even know how to coalesce it all into a single book. It, to me, it seemed like volumes. <laughs> I was like, how am I going to tell this story, especially since I feel like I missed the marketing wave when Ancient Aliens came out in 2009 on the History Channel. Right. You know, I, here I was sitting on all this stuff and I'm watching this going, yeah, they're starting to release stuff. Oh, my God. Man. <laughs> you know, I'm not the only one thinking about this stuff in my little, you know, hidden cubicle away from all the engineering eyes that might see what I'm up to. That's right. So that that progressed and it gave me a little, I don't know, it, it's one of those things where you and I both know if you try to create a market, it's much harder than catching a market and, take, and you know, catching the wind in your sails from the marketing effort that somebody else might have spent. Well, I couldn't spend the kind of money that History Channel spent. So I decided, okay, well, it must be time. And at about that time, Paul Hellyer came out on YouTube with his 25-minute lecture in front of Congress 
stating uh, who these races were, how long they'd been here, and here was this ex minister of defense saying it, and I thought, well, <laughs> well, if he can stand up and tell the truth, then I can too, you know. And I, I really, I really respect him for doing that, you know. It, uh, it really moved me off of, off of a dime. And from that point, I just basically started sharing my research. I'd done a genealogy table I'd been sitting on for years, trying to make sure I understood how all the players were and how this all fit together. And, and of course, I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I'm a scientist, so I'm corroborating it with the Bible. I'm corroborating it with the Colburn Bible, trying to understand if these beings were truly who the Sumerians said they were, did they possibly have other names in other cultures? Because it looks like they could live for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. And that took me down a deep rabbit hole when I realized that when I put down the Anunnaki Council of Twelve, as we were able to derive it from the Enuma Elish, the Atrahasis, and the Epic of Gilgamesh, they name most of the players in those three documents, according to them. Well, if you put those down and realize that in the Atrahasis account, who was at what rank on the council, and all of a sudden extend that over to Greece, you realize the Olympian Council was none other than the Anunnaki. And it goes on and on and on. I did it in the Indus Valley. I did it over in uh, the Viking culture into several, several others. Uh, and, uh, at four, and even the Irish culture. And at the forefront of it all are the high-level Anunnaki that were on that council, plus their offspring. And sometimes the offspring are changing. Yeah. To me, my favorite book by Sitchin, I love all of his books, but the favorite is The Lost Book of Enki mm -hmm. that he uh, published in 2002. Reads like Game of Thrones with horny aliens and spaceships. <laughs> I love that book. The only problem I had with ever referencing it was he, for some reason, didn't give us references like he did in all his other books. Yeah. Not odd. It, it, was he not allowed to use the references? Because that was so out of character for him. It was, but he just did a direct translation of it. And when you go through that, it makes an awful lot of sense. It sure is consistent particularly with the use of uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, Enlil tried to bump us off twice, first by not warning us of the deluge, and the second time I thought their use of nuclear weapons was rather interesting. Instead of dropping them on a city, they would drop them up when, mm -hmm. and then just simply devastate an area that was uninhabited and not useful so that the radiation would kill everybody in the town, and then they could use the town again. But it begs the question everybody is asking, all right, if the Anunnaki are coming back, who's going to be running the show, Enki or Enlil? Yeah, and you know, I've, I've said all along that I believe the advanced team that included Enki and Enlil and Ninlil and Ninurta, who was Apollo, and Marduk and Ningshida and Ninma, all of those ones that were in the early stories, uh, I, be I believe they stayed. They never left. They may have gone back and forth, but once they had set up their civilization here, they continued to rule it, whether it was uh, with liaison kings or demigods or what have you, but they never left. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, there's an interesting story. I'll give you a, a, an example of this. Back in uh, the Critias by Plato, or it may have been the Timaeus, I'll have to look which one it was, but right at the very end of the document when Atlantis had been infiltrated by genetic mixing and the people had become base and they'd lost their connection to the creator of all spirit, you know, and in destruction, and it was about to be destroyed. Right at that point, it was interesting. Uh, do you remember who was called in from the Anunnaki Council to come in uh, as kind of like a judge overseer? It was none other than Zeus. So he was brought in when it was time to rein in the destruction. Okay, well, Zeus was Enlil, and Poseidon was Enki. And, uh, and you can go on and on and on down that council. Ningshida, who was Thoth, was Hermes on that council. And so all, all, the, all the major players that were showing up in Samaria and Egypt were also showing up in, the, in this Greek god table. And so I thought that was uh, very, very telling about Enlil's role in bringing the end to a civilization that was ripe for destruction. And you know what? <laughs> when you look back at how he did this through history with uh, the primitive breeder worker program, after 600 years, they were proliferating because they could procreate at that point. And he called a council meeting and decided he wanted them gone. Uh, and it culminated with the uh, flood, but there was a lot more things he did before that. It took six years before he called for a flood. 
And in each one of those, he released a different disease, cut off the food, cut off the water, uh, did everything he, did, he could to, I don't know, maybe they had their own form of a Sumerian guidestones where they only had a certain number of people that were allowed, <laughs> just like the Georgia guidestones. I don't know. And it may have to do with the functional missions they had allocated to these primitive workers. Imagine you got what you needed and you're... Your worker, you, you know, you're like, well, I only need the manpower to reach this milestone of the Gantt chart, and I don't need you anymore. Well, then what? You either repurpose them to another project, or if you're done with that project for some period of time, maybe Enel decided the, this genetic offspring of his brother just needed to be wiped out because they were a threat, too. So that's when he call, called Enki, uh, the father of Atrahasis, to come and bring the flood. And, and if you read the account, I think this was later in the Atrahasis tablets, he refused to do it, but it came anyway. So I truly think, like you said, I think probably it was a Nibiru passage, and they had their watchers watching to see, you know, if the ice was going to break off the polar caps, if uh, there was going to be a CME or just whatever was going to happen, happen to the magnetic field. Oh, by the way, speaking of that, I just from NASA yesterday, and I, and I may have the number wrong, but the name was right. It was called Enlil 2.37. It shows the magne <laughs> magnetosphere of the, of the world <laughs> real time. I was like, it was, uh, it was on a link. I'll have to go pull it up for people. I'll put it in uh, my video when I put it up. I was, I was like, really? <laughs> how in your face can you be? So, uh, it's funny how they like to use that. They like to use the symbology. Mm -hmm. It leaks out from around the edges and around the corners, but then again, we've always noticed that. I mean, it's so in your face now. It's how, showing up at halftime ceremonies uh, with football and NFL. It, look at this tunnel ceremony they just did. You're talking about an abomination. Oh, my God. Was that <laughs> bizarre? Well, that I think we're sick. very close to a timing event. Yeah. But uh, I really think the New World Order forces are slightly behind, and they're, they're going to be pushing the milestones to get them completed to get what constructs they want in place prior to this chaos happening from the passage of Nibiru. And I think we both agree that those two items are not disjoint. The New World Order plans and the incoming arrival of Nibiru are very much tied together. What I see them doing is they want to keep people on the coastlines. They want them to die in place. It's population reduction. So face it, they look at us no differently than we look at catfish raised in farms. I agree, and this is the disturbing part. And because of that and how we've been treated over this last zodiacal house, you know, the right-wing Christian community has deemed every Anunnaki a fallen angel, every single one of them, even though three of them were involved in their genetic creation account, and they wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for them <laughs> to complain about. So as I've said before, from my analysis of the Anunnaki, they, they – had a wide-ranging set of personalities, and they were all on the same evolutionary path, the higher consciousness that we were, even though they'd been around a lot longer. Did they? So when you see the Greek drama that went on in between these uh, beings, I think that was real. <laughs> and look, we, we have the same attributes in our civilization. Yeah. Serial killer to saint, just like they did. So you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater completely and go, okay, they're all fallen angels. They landed on Mount Hebron, so they're all here to you know, occupy us as demons. That's not true. I don't buy that. If they were really to write Anunnaki history about their involvement with us in terms of genetic programming, it would read more like, Hey, little girl here in the bushes, want a baby Ruth? <laughs> Enki just, you know, you know, I got to have me some of that. Next thing you know, homo sapien. And I think there will be Anunnaki that are going to splinter away. They're going to say, hey, we really do want to walk path towards creator, not away from creator. Mm -hmm. But I think in the large part, their ability to prolong their lives has become, by this point, I would venture to say, uh, <laughs> bordering on the amazing. Yeah, I, I think in the right circumstances, they had DNA that didn't have telomeres that decayed. Imagine design, you know, if you're that far along in your evolutionary process, uh, why would you allow such a thing? Yeah. That was done intentionally to give us a 120-year clamp. I think that giving us short lifespans actually enhanced our ability of our species to evolve. I agree with you. You give a species a short time to adapt to the circumstances and they're going to 
the work that they do is going to expand to fill the time they have. Well, if you've got a very short time, they're going to, it's going to appear like they're working really fast to get there. And I think that could be an intentional thing. And the, the, I want to bring up something else, though. Uh, Go ahead. You know, we definitely were enslaved. There's no question about it. Genetically, if you just look at plants we were given, we were enslaved. The question is, was it intended to be forever? Because you remember in the Lost Book of Enki, he had essentially wrestled with this fate and destiny question about whether he was just jump-starting a species, having the intellect to do it, since he was a geneticist, whether he should do it or not. And then he asked, and then remember in the book, he said, well, the creator of all has given me this intelligence, so am I not supposed to use it? Uh, yeah. So then if you look at a human and go, wow, we're pretty complex. We seem to have this electromagnetic spectrum interface. And I just read an article today uh, about the nature of light and sound and a different effects that scientists have discovered in Russia affecting DNA that they feel like they don't even have to operate or even do gene splicing. They can use the electromagnetic spectrum and vibration to change it and modulate the correct lexicon onto uh, a light carrier is what they were talking about doing. Well, I talked about this three years ago <laughs> when I was on radio and I was doing an experiment at Cal IT2 at UCSD. Right. Which came to a head where I had asked for funding from the NIH to do exactly that with my kid who had the Georgia syndrome so that I could monitor his brainwave frequency, possibly change it, and then look at the, the potential to modulate the correct lexicon of DNA onto a, and I was looking at a 528 hertz carrier because it seemed to be the frequency that was causing DNA to relax. That doesn't mean it was the right mm -hmm. one, but it was a carrier frequency that I could use to modulate data onto. And I really wanted to do this, and uh, I got completely shut down the university for try attempting to do this. And it's one of the reasons I left. Well, they probably just didn't see an ROI in it. Well, the, the basic idea that I was getting at is we know that uh, we're susceptible to the electromagnetic spectrum in a negative way, like from HARP or imposing something in your brainwave region that could either put a thought in your head or scramble your brainwaves, or in an extreme case, you can use a dangling microwave device underneath an aircraft and fry a populace if you wanted to. Raytheon built one. So the idea of electromagnetic interface with us primitive humans points to the idea that when Enki built us, he also put circuits in us such that we could continue this evolutionary path to higher consciousness. And I truly believe this warring issue over how the slaves should have access to higher consciousness or just be slaves was a real thorn in the side and a point of contention between, and not generalized, I call them the Enkiites and Enlites, but definitely between Enki and Enlil, and, and Enki's son, Nishida, as well. You realize he was Thoth teaching the people access to fourth dimensional consciousness in their mystery schools along the Nile. Well, that's just, <laughs> that's just down the coastline from the Levant where and Will had his headquarters once he moved out of Sippar and ended up in uh, Jerusalem. That was his mission control right. center. Uh, and Nippur used to be the mission control center pr prior to that. And then you, you, know, you start tying in, well, what was Baalbek? Gilgamesh talked about rockets taking off in the land. So in general, the Anunnaki said they had bond heaven earth facilities in the Sinai in that area and north of Sippar before the first flooding event happened there. So... So, but not to lose track of this idea that we, that Anki believed he was doing a genetic jumpstart on a primitive being that already existed. Really, if you look at it from a, a geological standpoint in our evolution of, of the species, he did us a big favor. It could have been millions of years from now before we had the ability to have the kind of cognition we have now. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? So he actually jumps us by giving us intellect, even though he clamped our lifespan by 120 years. Okay, but let me throw it at a different angle. We're a blend of Anunnaki and hominid genes. What if this ability that we possess, you and I have been talking about, doesn't come from the Anunnaki side? It comes from our hominid side. Wow, well, that's very possible. Well, let's, we'd have to go examine a, a Neanderthal or a Denisovian to see if, well, do they have nerve ganglia lined up along their spine the way we do? They probably do, actually. You could very well be right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, their pineal gland may be closer to the surface of their cranium where they actually had some sort of potential to receive radiation from the sun and have it trigger their reptilian functions. Because, you know, we had a reptilian brain before that, too. Mm-hmm. 
So you go to reptilian, mammalian, and then you end up with the neocortex. So it's very possible that, that they did that. Now, if they did that, then it wasn't anticipated and was not something that they intentionally gave us, but it is something we inherited that who gave it to us, we'd have to look up and go, Yahweh. Well, see, that's where we disagree, Bushel. When I looked into the... Uh, text that came out of the city of war and i did a show on this not long ago and i mean i'm not i'm not picking on labels or names there's like three thousand labels for people called god okay okay but that particular one uh, i have to take issue with because it shows up in the lamentations of war as none other than endel so he's portraying himself as god he's not he's not the creator of all so when i hear the word yahweh used as the creator of all i usually have to stand up and say i don't think so instead of saying creator of all i'm the creator. Something, yeah, yeah, yeah. The infinite. As long as we don't confuse them with the Anunnaki, yeah. No, you're right. I mean, they, they want to be worshipped as gods. But this is something that the infinite, whatever intelligence created our universe, whatever that intelligence is that makes galaxies and makes universes and multiverses, that was going, okay, you boys are playing around. Well, it gives me an opportunity to play around too. Mm. Consequently, as a result of that, we possess abilities that other races would wish we didn't possess. And that could be threatening to them in terms of what happens if we awaken to our full potential. Right. A, a potential that could very well be of a source that completely defies all other sorts it's a, from a transcendent source right i think we totally agree i think we totally agree on that and as a matter of fact uh, in my second book uh, thoth starts talking about one of his emerald tablets the tenets mm -hmm. of which we were designed from from the creator of all and you know <laughs> talking about all the multi-dimensions and blah, blah blah and how we fit into the whole thing Right, And he, he basically teaches a, a concept that I think is very close to Gnosticism in that we were a created as an element or an instance of the sun soul, creator of all, which was kind of like a light encoding of the reality matrix to create all matter anyway. So we're just another instance of that. Yeah. And that the uh, current world has been occupied and cre controlled through uh, kind of a false being who is very powerful, but is also... Uh, the, the great deceiver. And so I see those as coincident. And I've always seen Enel as the great deceiver, along with some of the other beings that have worked with him. And there are, there are Enkiites that are working with him that are just, just as bad. So, you know, uh, so I can see why people would label him that way. But let's go back to your idea of the creator of all. Right. Creating an, an instance of a being such that it can evolve to the point to have a cognizant reflective consciousness to realize it was created for, as an instance from the creator of all. That's the path, right? Right. And then have a relationship that's different at that point when you're out of your enslaved consciousness to learn your material lessons in this simulator. So that's kind of how I see it. Well, Thoth tells us exactly that we're all sun souls, we're eternal beings, and that really when you wake up a certain energy by paying attention to that, not that the, you know, it's the, in the big church that's got uh, sacred geometry design so the sound bounces around just right. It's, it's none of the external. It's all about finding that energy within you that breaks the illusion of the material world. And this is very Gnostic in its premises. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. I went and looked at Gnosticism before I got on here because I think it, it, there's a very close tie-in to the way Thoth saw the world and the way Gnostics saw it, at least the early ones. And I know there's five or six different varieties. This is the very stuff of Sitchin. The question, who are we? Exactly. Who the hell are we? You know, and I don't need, you know, somebody to tell me, sure, here's who we are. Now send us a check. Exactly. We want to find out something meaningful that resonates within us. Well, you know, you have to ask yourself, what, what will it take for us to even believe that? And I think personally, it's going to be exposed when the full understanding of what happened to our DNA, where was it spliced? What's this link polymer over here that gives us language that didn't give the, the that's the same um, uh, material in the genetic code in an ape, but they don't have language. And, and that particular link polymer is inactivated. Those kind of levels of detail where you see, where you can truly go, okay, 
there's a here's how we came out as an Anunnaki slash bipedal hominid chimera and put a fork in it. And, you know, the geneticists, I believe, are very close to having that ability right now. And a couple of them are playing around with it. I don't know if they'll stay alive, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, so I won't even name I won't even name their names. But somebody posted an article not long ago looking into this junk DNA, just like the Russians are doing and finding these anomalies, finding out there's a lexicon there. It's not junk. The term junk DNA is a real misnomer. I mean, it's uncoded DNA. They just haven't sorted it out. But <laughs> well, I hope whoever starts sorting it out lives a little longer. Mm -hmm. You know, that was Sitchin's dream, was to see that genetic proof come out before he died. That was one of the things he was really focused on. So I hope the heroes that are out there uh, s stick with it, because they're going to get barbs thrown at them like you cannot even imagine in this genetic space. Oh, yeah. That's going to fall on them. But anyway, we're talking a lot about the Anunnaki, and the Anunnaki are, in the coming flyby, they're going to be playing a role. And from one standpoint, you can look at the flyby and go, we're all good today, you know, with the people running around doing the chicken little dance. Mm -hmm. For me, in chaos is opportunity. And so that, for me, is the big issue of the coming tribulation. So. Let's jump from that, and we'll come back from the third segment. And let's talk about surviving the tribulation process, evolution, and all that good stuff. Okay, sounds good. I hope you're enjoying this interview with Gerald Clark. This third segment coming up is the longest of the three, and we're going to get into some pretty juicy stuff, so it's well worth the ride. Also, I want to point out to you, Your Own World USA is a subscriber-supported site. 90% of the material we publish on Yowza is free to the public, always has been, always will be. But then there is the special media for subscribers only, and that's access to our Cut to the Chase shows going all the way back to 2004. If you care to make a difference, please check out our subscription options and help us move the ball down the field, so to speak. Now, let's get back to it with Gerald. I'm back on with Gerald, and in this segment, we're going to talk about surviving the tribulation process as a result of the Planet X flyby, evolution, the Anunnaki. Okay. Let's throw some spaghetti on the wall here, Gerald, and look at what's going to happen in the next few years. Okay. Well, I want to start out by saying when I get to this place where we're describing a response to an extinction level, possibly an extinction level event, this is a really difficult place to put yourself into, okay? First of all, you don't want to be seen as somebody who's chicken little and the sky's falling when it comes to, to sharing information. So I've wrestled very deeply with the different vignettes that people could respond to. And actually, uh, there was a series done, I want to say it was on uh, History Discovery Channel some time ago, and I think it was called Blackout, maybe you know, where they simulated and an electromagnetic pulse weapon being used knocks out all the electricity, and then it picks out about five different participants to look at their varied stages of readiness and how it impacted them when this event went down, okay? Right. And it was so symbolic of where we are right now in deciding how to, de how to deal with uh, a possible cataclysmic event like this. And by the way, you know, a new Buru has passed many, many, many times before. And the Earth is still here. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't mean it wasn't the catalyst for the destruction of many civilizations and loss of life and floods, according to the Egyptians. Okay. So... I, when I started first realizing that this could be real, I started going through all these scenarios in my mind, just like a lot of other people are once they just now are finding out about it. You know, the first response is usually a, a primitive response, which is fight or flight to save your carcass. So it's like, 
I gotta, I gotta get out of this area. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta get some food. I gotta dig me a hole in the ground. And when that thing passes back over, poo, it'll be good. I'll come out and plant my seeds and we'll go on with life. That's probably not the reality of what's going on here. This, this uh, situation is much more severe in that for, for, let's, let's play a couple of scenarios. Number one, let's take the person living in Los Angeles who has absolutely no knowledge of Nibiru coming and all of a sudden they experience a, a very large earthquake, uh, maybe only a 7.8 or an 8, not enough to liquefy the ground, but enough to really get your attention that something's going on. You know, maybe some incursion of a little bit of a tsunami, nothing huge, but enough to go, okay, there's something really going on here. And that person then decides to take action, goes and decides they don't want to live right next to the coast, and they get a little mountain cabin where if something really went down, that they would have a, a safe place, a safer place to go for a while. Are you with me? Yeah, except, you know, I got to tell you, I do a lot of stuff on survival relocation. Mm -hmm. To me, there are three givens, okay? Do we survive as a species? Take it to the bank. Do we rebuild? Take it to the bank. Do we go to space? Take it to the bank. The $64,000 question is, how do we go to space? Do we have a Star Trek future? Or we go out there like a bunch of crazy Anunnaki stormtroopers scaring the hell out of everybody? That, to me, is the big issue. But for the people in California, if it doesn't close a Costco, they'll forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's another possible scenario here. Before we go responding out of fear to what's going to happen, I want to lay out one more option. Suppose that through this cyclical process of going through the galactic ecliptic, right. our energy being heightened by the exposure to that. And you talked about what really happened in 2012 with the Mayan calendar. I think that was part of it. We entered the galactic center as a whole solar system. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think there's something much bigger going on here that I have to ask myself, is this something that's intended by the creator of all? Mm. And we, I, the creator of all allows good and evil in all situations. But what if there was a galactic timing cycle such that we were being vectored to a higher dimension and now it's time? Is that possible? Well, that's the platonic year, the yuga cycle. Exactly. So I, I thought about this deeply and I thought, you know, number one, I don't want to discourage people from moving to a safer place. Don't hear me saying that, okay? Because I moved away from the coast because it's just a pragmatic. If you know a tree's going to fall on you, you're probably going to get out of the way. But here's where the <laughs> no, is. no, no. Well, not everyone. <laughs> I've got a million dollars and I can go build an underground bunker and I can provision it to hold 10 people or whatever. And my brother doesn't. And he's not one of the 10. How am I going to reconcile that? And my brother now, let's extend it out to an entire populace. Okay, so... All of a sudden you're going, well, I can save myself, but I can't save any of you. Right. And this is the position the government is in if they're trying to, you know, have underground bunkers to save a population. Now, if they'd have really cared about their population, they would have built underground facilities or some facility to deal with this issue. They've known about it since the 50s. You know, Sweden did that. Sweden has enough capacity below ground for all of its citizens. Do you think it'll be affected by a 9.0 plus earthquake? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I look at other nations I know. and what they're doing quietly. And then I look at our nation, Sweden's building bunkers. We're buying 1.7 billion rounds of hollow point ammunition mm -hmm. and building FEMA camps. Well, that tells you a lot about these entities that Paul Hillier was pointing out that landed in the United States post-World War II. Mm -hmm. And in my book, I, I believe it was none other than the great destroyer, Enlil. He's the in God you can trust on the back of the bill, okay? His sign is all over it. And if actually, in my second book, I went back and started putting together a weapons table that started right after World War II, the programs the U.S. got involved with. And his name, yeah. Zeus's name, was all over these uh, ICBMs, and every kind of missile you can imagine was coming out. I was like, wow, <laughs> the... the uh, Olympian God Table is showing up as the names of the weapons <laughs> over here since 1945. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, so, you've got a point. So, so it, what it comes down to is to the degree with which I have the resources to try to save my carcass so that I could face them off, tell them yes or no on a carrot, and determine whether I'm going to be enslaved by them or not. This is a Mad Max world we're talking about. Do you, <laughs> that's not what I want. I don't want that. 
Same here. And if I was to be wiped out in this material form, I know my energy goes on indefinitely. And if I want to be in an avatar in another dimension or not, that's probably up to uh, this process of the evolution of higher consciousness. So this is where I come down to the point of, and this is comp it's more complicated to go, well, should I get the car and go over here and take my bug out back? You know, it's more about ultimately you've got to look at all across the spectrum. People don't have the resources to the coast. If they could afford to do that and lose their job and everything else. Yeah, it's not easy to dislodge and, and go move somewhere else and make a new way. Okay, especially in another country. Yeah. So you know, it, it makes it much more much harder. You got all the immigration to deal with and blah blah blah. It, assuming the borders are even going to be open, which I think they'll be closed very shortly, and I think we agree on that. Yeah, I remember I had Bob Fletcher on, and he gave me a really savvy insight. He said, "We know we're six months out." from the onset of the severe earth effects mm -hmm. when they're going to declare martial law for any reason other than planet X. I agree. And I think that's already, there's so many different catalysts they could choose. My feeling, frankly, and you know what I'm telling folks is wherever you plan to be, be there by the end of the summer. And I also tell them there is no safe place. There's only safer places. Excellent point. So this brings up the really hard part, Marshall, and I did this in my conclusion in my new Buru Orbital Report. Now imagine you have the wherewithal and the knowledge like you have, and you know a flood's coming in, and you go up just high enough where it's not going to affect you, and you couldn't get most of the town to come with you, right? Do you want to be the one looking on that precipice watching your friends and family die while you saved your ass? This is a really hard one for me. I mean, just difficult. First off, I have to say, this work is transformative. I have a relationship with God now that I never had before. The creator of everything. Well, actually, you know, I have, to, I have to chime in and say my process of weeding out the falseness and finding the truth, it truly is a, an a uplifting, an ascension process when you make your final connection with the true creator of all and the tenets. That he lays, that he or she or it lays out from this ninth dimension uh, for us all to live by, and I, I put this in my second book. And, and Thoth and Anki and and, and Ninma, all three that were involved in the Anunnaki creation account, mm -hmm. they all seem to be very deferential to the tenets of the Creator of all. It's almost like they're working for them. So this whole experiment with us and being exposed to this dualism of dark and light. Yeah. I think it's all the way back to the creator of all. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we want to blame something, but the reality is it's part of our evolutionary path to see this stuff. It is, but you know, for me, it led me to developing a, a philosophy of what I call perpetual genesis, which is the church that Jennifer and I have, Knowledge Mountain Church of Perpetual Genesis, a non-denominational teaching church. We tell folks, look, if your core faith's fine, ain't broke, don't fix it. If you're like us and you've been kicked out of a lot of churches and study groups, we're the ones that are willing to answer the questions that are not on the thou shalt only ask questions on this list list. Well, good for you. I think people that are involved in, in religions, in a group, consensus like that, they need something like what you're creating. Yeah. You know, some people find the path alone. Some people find it in a group, and it really depends on the type of person you are. My One of my kids mm -hmm. is completely a technocrat, and he's going to find it through math and science the way I did, whereas the other one's going to find it through relationship in groups. Yeah. So, so what you're doing is a real benefit to humanity, especially all those that, uh, that need that, and there's a lot of them. And it's folks who've been in awareness for a long time. And the, and the idea for it, I was talking to someone who's a, a very spiritual Christian, and I was talking about all the time, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to tell people you're not alone. You're not alone. There's others out there like you, and there's a reason for your awareness, because you are a teacher, you're a mentor, you're a comforter. And he said, you're ministering to people. Mm -hmm. Why not start a church? <laughs> you know, what I do with perpetual genesis is I start with a simple question. I just say, okay, where does God live? What does God do? Mm -hmm. What's God's mission? It's the creation of life from the lifelessness of the void. Exactly. I got drawn so, so deeply into that question, and Thoth brings this up about the laws of the creator of all in terms of two things, time 
and the creation of matter. Mm -hmm. And you think about the creation of matter, planets and trees and rocks, and, but you don't think about that matter being yourself. And when it all comes down to what he's describing is a light encoding of the reality matrix using the simple elements movie we have from the periodic table of elements, you know, with the covalent bonds and all the different bonding techniques to create matter. Well, somehow this being has the ability to take light, turn it into the right frequency, stitch this matter together and create inanimate and animate forms, you know, us avatars that are created with the spirit of the creative also that we can have this material experience. That's right. The Anunnaki are made of carbon. So are we. Carbon comes from dead stars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. all star stuff. I agree. I think they had to take on avatar bodies in the different dimensions they went into, depending on the environmental constraints of what planet you were on. So, and, they, you know, this brings up a good thing, that a point that I brought up in my first book that I hardly ever talk about. Well, you realize Enki was a genetic designer along with Nishida, and Isis was involved. Right. Well, in the Bible, Enlil, the editorial oversight of the whole thing, he points out 11 times what a stiff-necked people we are. And some of them it talks about being stubborn. But the other part of it, I took it literally, and I, as a structural integrator, I don't know if you know that about me, I, <laughs> for many years I ran a private practice relating people's body to the gravity field. Uh -huh. And in that process, I realized that because of the design of a human, that there are places in the back of the heel, the back of the pelvis, and the back of the occiputs on the back of your head, that if, it's, if you're just born that way and there's no intervention done whatsoever, to have a vertical relationship in the gravity field. And therefore, you know, we end up with these kyphotic humps and all the deviations from this very strong force that gravity has on you. Okay. In summary, what I'm saying is Enel was telling Enki, his brother, you really messed up your design here. You, you didn't take into account the proper relationship of this biological form to the gravity field on this particular planet. Your DNA came from Nibiru, and you're mixing it with a being that's experiencing a different force of gravity. And I think that's truly what he was saying. He said it 11 times in the Bible. Well, you know what? All I can say to that is thank God for chiropractic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, I thought that was, that was very interesting. So the whole idea of being an avatar is something that I focus on a lot. And I didn't when I started. But when I went back and reread Enki's creation of this Adapa and infusing energy from this other watcher being or this Ajiji into this other form and bringing it to life, it was like the Frankenstein story. <laughs> it probably, it probably <laughs> was where that story came from, actually, with Mary Shelley. But when I thought about that and this idea of energy is neither created nor destroyed and it's only changes state and he's talking about taking the essence of this one being and put it in another one, well, this is crazy, crazy science, right? Yeah. I mean, just crazy if you have that level of control over the electromagnetic spectrum. So the reality is if they did that, we're all avatars. We're all their avatars. Well. With, with our escape mechanism. <laughs> nothing ever works according to plan. But, you know, we always focus on the catastrophic things that are going to happen and the massive loss of life. And mm -hmm. it does weigh heavily on my soul. And I think about all of the people, especially those living along the coastlines or on major fault lines, mm -hmm. which is why, why does Vivos build their underground commercial shelters on places that actually sit near fault lines? Probably the same reason they're putting nuclear reactors along the New Madrid fault and along the coastlines where they'll be happy irradiators so that they can truly uh, mark out some natural territory where nobody's going to return. Yep, that's a nature preserve now. <laughs> no question about it. That's right, and we can look at it at night because it glows in the dark. <laughs> All of this, you and I both talk about it. We both see it. We research it. We write about it. Mm -hmm. But I really am looking at the silver lining. Oh, yeah, let's get, let's get to that because if you go down to the details of a magnetic shift, a pole shift, big waves, earthquakes, you know, we we know that's a potential. Yeah. But what but, but I like to focus on is, like you said, is, that, you know, where are we going as a species? Do we need to save these avatar bodies that were genetically designed to be enslaved? Or are we going to get a, a new body in a different dimension? Because I truly think, according to Thoth's writings, that we are changing as a result of our exposure to the galactic center. I think we will go back to being 
a true instance of the creator of all. Essentially, you're going to start accumulating light until you don't need a body anymore. That's what how they describe it. And if you think about that from a Hindu yogic tradition, that's one chakra at a time until they're fully on and you're having a multidimensional experience. And I think some people are having that and I always have, you know, through time. But look at just you and I as researchers. Mm -hmm. When I started this, my first article on Planet X was January of uh, 2002. And I started doing my research in 2001. Back then, I was a born hard geek. If Marshall of 2001 were to hear the Marshall of today, that Marshall would go, ooh, baby, you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I was, I was exactly that way. I don't know what happened in the year, about the year 2000 is when I started really looking into this stuff. You know, maybe it was some galactic timing thing where the frequency that was hitting our antennas got jacked up a little bit more and we start we woke up just en enough to start going down the path i'm not sure how this works i think you and i are doing what we're doing now because before we were ever born we decided to do this we made our promise to creator and we said when we incarnate hit set the alarm clock and then boom we're going to buckle in and do the job yeah i agree with you but you never saw that coming in your path did you no, but you never do. <laughs> the past is like the rearview mirror of a car. Objects seem closer than they appear. But because you were paying attention to what you were paying attention to, out of your own way, and you kept doing it no matter how many barbs you got. And, you know, I've seen the kind of comments that showed up on these shows. It's like, wow. <laughs> oh, God, you get the poison pens. Two guys just trying to tell the truth with data, and, and that's the kind of response you get from the world. Well, this is, this is worse than the allegory of the case. But you know something? It's worked to my advantage, and I'll tell you how it works to your advantage. It's just schoolyard politics, man. Everybody wants to see who's getting a whooping. So they come to our websites and they look at it. And so I've found that that kind of nastiness actually has worked to my advantage over time, not against it. Well, actually, you have a very grand skill at diplomacy and tactics, the way you handled uh, the L.A. Marzulli video. You know, I was really proud of you for uh, taking it line by line, going, no, this is what you said, and this is the truth. And and didn't disparage the character or anything like that. Just dealt with the facts of, you know, what's going on here. And whether it was intentional or not, I don't really care. But if it was intentional, it, it's far more dire than <laughs> than even what Michael Heiser is doing. You know, when I looked at it, Gil Broussard, and you go through his graphics, and there's nothing scientific about it. He doesn't use standard terminology. There's no way to extract the text in any kind of context. But he shows an illustration in one of his slides where he calls it Planet 7X because it's seven times the size of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And he shows it passing at 0.7 LD, lunar distance, you know, the distance between here and the, the moon passing between Earth and the moon. You know, if that happened, we would all be with the dinosaurs body that large, seven times the size of the Earth. That, that, no, that number was borrowed. It wasn't even calculated. By the way, I'll, I'll give you a little, I'll share with you a little bit. On VA-243 in my Nibiru orbital report, I decided to go after the sitchiniswrong.com uh, dishonorable person. Oh, good for you. Good for you. And I took uh, VA-243 apart, and uh, actually the first thing, I'll explain it real quickly for people who haven't seen it. You know, off VA-243, you have these uh, Anunnaki beings sitting there with a the plow, and then the, uh, the looked like a sun, a central sun with a bunch of dots around it, right? Well, somebody had taken the time to blow this up, do a digital analysis of it, and measure the pixel distance across it to see if there was any correlation of those spherical bodies shown in two dimension on this cylinder seal actually matched uh, our actual planets that we have, <laughs> you know, in their dimension and their orbits and such. And they were playing around with some math looking for a transform to try to get uh, as accurate as they could. And they came up with, uh, without even doing a transform at all, just, cor just a, a statistical correlation of this data set to this data set. Right. Without any effort whatsoever. You can do it in Microsoft Excel on a spreadsheet, okay? <laughs> it comes out at 89% accuracy on the cylinder seal. 
And, you know, this was the focal point of uh, Sitchin being lambasted for claiming the Anunnaki came from another planet because there was a 10th a planet showing up and there are not just nine in our solar system like, like what we thought, right? Right. Well, when you measure each one of those pixels across the diameter of those spheres and then compare it to our planet, the one we didn't have to compare with was Nibiru. But by analysis, since you had the other ones, you could do a, a you know an equivalence equation to come up with the size of what that sphere is relative to Pluto, for instance, right? Right. So I did that, and actually it came out to 17.8 times bigger than the Earth, not seven times, 17.8. And that, and I published this so you can see it mathematically how I did it. Uh -huh. Well, you know, it turns out to be the second largest in the constellation, even bigger than uh, Neptune and Pluto <laughs> and Saturn. So it's, it's, just, it's smaller than the sun. Well, I think it, it, the sun was, what, uh, 1.4 million miles in diameter? And, this, and I think the one I came up with, is, I want to say it was 225,000 miles in diameter. Wow. But anyway, the, the numbers are there. Well, what I did is I said, well, the Sumerians weren't using base 10 math. <laughs> they were using sexagesimal math. So they had a mapping to go from the planetary system into a, a cuneiform seal or a cylinder seal they rolled out on clay that gave you this reverse 3D image, right? Right. Well, when I did that and assumed that the small data set on V243 was probably log base 6, and then the larger data set that represented our planets was probably log base something, either 660 or 66, I played around with it. Right. Well, when I did that, guess what the correlation was between those images on VA243 and the actual diameter in kilometers of our planets, 99.503%. Mm. No kidding. So I published that as well. I was like, okay, <laughs> it doesn't need to be any more accurate to, for me than that to indicate that what they were showing there was our solar system and our planets. So I was convinced after that, even though, you know, the Sitchin dot wrong focus exactly on VA243 to say, no, that's a sun, no, that's that's not a planet, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was a total misdirection as far as I'm concerned. You know, recently after Caltech announced Planet Nine, and I think the whole Planet Nine announcement was crap. What Mike Brown did up there, he should be ashamed of himself, really. But, you know, he had to do it because what happened was the astronomers at Alma Mm -hmm. I read that. <laughs> That's exactly why they did it. That's exactly why they did it. And they said, okay, we went and we killed these guys. Now we got to put up an alternate theory to keep the yada yada going or whatever their theme is. But you, know, you had Italian astronomers that immediately went and looked at Mike Brown's paper and they went. Which was a simulation with no data. I mean, that was simulation. They said you could eliminate half of the sky survey area immediately. So if they're going to publish a paper and you got a bunch of Italians that can sit there and look at what they've said and said, you know what, you can cut this search area by half immediately. And if it was a well thought out paper, that would have been in that paper from the get go. And so to me, it was all part of this suppression where Alma, they got in the ringer, was when they said one of the objects. Well, I don't think they have muzzles. I don't think they have muzzles. Huh? I don't think they're muzzled the way the uh, astronomers are in the U.S. now. We don't have any brave people like Harrington and Tom, Tom Van Flanderen anymore. Where are they? No, they were muzzled. <laughs> we watched this. No, they were muzzled. Jeff Bezos, all right, owns Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the Darth Vader of publishing. If you're in the publishing industry, you despise this man. He is Darth Vader. Trust me. You know, I mean, he sits up there in his headquarters in Amazon, and you can just hear him going, we're going to kill all competition in the publishing industry. You know, it's like. I know. That's why CreateSpace won't even do a hardback book for you anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thing was, one of his newspapers, and he used the Washington Post, and he used that to slam these guys. But I think what really torched it set off this whole Planet Nine from cockamamie. That's what I call it. Mm -hmm. It's just Planet Nine from cockamamie nonsense. It was because Alma said one of the objects they spotted could be a potentially cold brown dwarf star. Mm -hmm. 
I saw their release and I knew immediately whatever was coming out of Caltech was a red herring. <laughs> actually, actually, I had my kids sniffing around going, what are you hearing over there? What the hell's going on? <laughs> Let's talk about the measurement of this gravity wave that uh, Kip Thorne and those guys were talking about way back when in the book Future of Space Time. By the way, I was very, very, very closely watching that because I was uh, in the free space optics business and we were buying the different avalanche photodiodes and such to uh -huh. improve the sensitivity, increase the range, all that. Well, that's, this was their problem in measuring le the gravity wave with LIGO was uh, they were waiting for the telecom industry to find some material <laughs> that gave them more decimals so they could say, yep, there it is or there it isn't. Uh -huh. That's a whole other matter. I, I think we may want to talk about that as a whole other matter, but that's, that's a whole other ruse too. Yeah. Well, you know, Caltech is a state-sponsored school. And given what I've seen going on in the state of California, I don't recommend anybody continue to slave for that awful system. It's terrible. California is awful, just awful what's going on there. Yeah. Legally, politically, immigration-wise, they've just destroyed that place. I'm from San Diego, but I have no interest in even going back there. It's just so awful. I'm glad I moved out of California, especially now. They have forced immunization for seniors. Mm, anybody exposed to a kid there has got to get their uh, their uh, vaccine, right? And, and you listen, I don't care what anybody's been told. When you find out what's actually in those vaccines and what they're capable of doing to you, you shouldn't be letting them put anything in your body. I'd rather face it off right then and have a slave rebellion than allow them to stick a needle in my arm with what they've got in those things. Amen, brother. I'm not convinced that my kid who has a genetic disorder it was not caused by vaccines and Pitocin and all the other things that they used on the mom. My wife, her youngest boy, the darkest memory of her life was holding him down as an infant so that he got all those inoculations because after that, his brain was fried. Mm. Heard this from so many other people. And there are folks that really believe that they're profiling. What they're trying to do is find the children of light. Oh, I don't, I don't doubt it at all, because they're the ones that are going to wake up and change the plans of the new world order if they're, if they're able to. That's right. You know, that's the ones that they're going after, and this is just ugly. It is just simply ugly. But Well, let, let's maybe migrate toward that, uh, your concept and my concept of what the silver lining is, if, if, if there is one. Do you want to start and talk about it? Okay. This will be a good way to wrap up the show. Mm-hmm. You know, Sun Tzu said, don't start something unless you have a vision of success. Mm -hmm. And for me, what's that vision of success? There's going to come a time towards the worst part of the tribulation. The elites are going to come up from their underground bunkers and they're going to, you know, look at what we got for you. Take the chip and you can have it. Once people do that, it's going to be electronic Prozac. But to me, what success looks like is when they do come up with their little inducement, their bribery, that enough people really understand what's at stake to say no. Not to the carrot, but to the stick. Mm -hmm. And if enough people do that, then we truly could unleash an evolutionary event. We could wind up having a Star Trek future. That, for me, is what mm -hmm. success looks like a Star Trek future for our species. I guess I somewhat share your light at the end of the tunnel. I guess what I see as the light at the end of the tunnel for me is, A, if I want to have an avatar body that isn't genetically clamped, that can be truly free and peruse the different dimensions like they do. Well, I like that. I prefer that over this genetic enslaved model. So I'm not interested in, I'm not suicidal and, and never have been. And I'm going to do my mission right up to the very last, just like Woody Harrelson in the travel trailer when Yellowstone blows, right? He was there broadcasting in the movie 2012. That's how I'm going to go out. I'm not going to live in fear. I know that I can possibly move away from the coast, but it's only possibly just a safer place. Imagine you get 400, 500 mile an hour surface winds. You get <laughs> falling meteorites. You get nuclear radiation. I don't think the surface could possibly be survivable. And how many people have the wherewithal to dig underground, get generators, get grow lights, you know, all that stuff? That's really expensive. Most of us don't have the capability of doing that. 
So you can go to a safer place, but I, I would I would tell people stop right now and consider that you're an infinite energy and how to what extent are you going to try to keep this me host alive so that it could possibly be enslaved with these new world order freaks that want to stay on this prison planet. I don't think we're intended to stay here forever. I think our lesson simulator is to graduate from this morass and move up in the elevation of consciousness. And I don't think it's making a deal with a character stick is where I even want to be. As a matter of fact, why don't we just have everybody right now that drives the trucks, that shoots the weapons, that does everything the New World tells them to do, to just stop doing any of it. Don't do any of it. And then what are they going to do? Are they going to take their <laughs> take all that stuff and move it in the tunnels? And do it? Listen, you stop facilitating them doing what you're doing to you, and it's over. That's where it ends. Saying, like, no. You guys want to go in here? No, our people are going to block this tunnel, and you can die up here with us, just like all the rest of us. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> it can happen right now, and they definitely don't want us saying that. I don't want to wait till after the breweries come, and you know, there's a destruction in a Mad Max world that may not even be inhabitable for a very long time. There's all kinds of possibilities, but I just refuse to give up trying. I know. It's part of our program, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I take it one day at a time, and you know, for me, all of this is like we're going through a very dark tunnel with a lot of twists and turns. Mm -hmm. God will light a candle, and I walk up to that candle, and I wait. And sure enough, in the distance, God lights another candle, and I walk up to that one. And you know, my life right now, I just walk from candle to candle and have faith that God will just keep lighting them. And I know at the backside of that is blue skies and sweet water. I have to tend to agree with you. Once, uh, according to Thoth, you know, once this nuclear war comes to fruition, which has looked like it's going to happen, uh -huh. he says these uh, these beings that have been watching our enslavement that uh, he's working with, they're essentially, I would call them the right hand agents of the creator of all. He talks about, about them as being these lords of the, the galactic cycles, these wobble cycles to coordinate all life merging into one plane eventually in the future. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. So I think that truly is the path we're on. So for me, I'm going to do some pr pragmatic things. And even if I had a bunch of money, which I don't, I think I would stay with the populace that needs people like us that aren't going to abandon them. There you go. And if, and if I die in the middle of that, so what? I have absolutely zero fear of death, none whatsoever. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't scare me at all. Same here. So not that I'm looking forward to it. I, I mean, I've been given a spirit like you to keep doing your avatar mission. Like you said, we probably chose this mission before we even came into the body. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we were up in heaven and, you know, I was like, like remember in the army and they said, you and the green step <laughs> forward. <laughs> uh, we need 49 heroes uh, to step forward and go to this extraterrestrial planet and do this mission. Yeah. But, you know, I'm glad both of us as avatars have decided to overcome the fears that we do have about judgment and our peers and get out of our own way and just bring this forward. Because I think it, the information truly puts people in a position to run for their lives out of fear or out of love, realize that the creator of all is right there with you. And it's all just part of the, the simulation. And there, there are thousands and thousands of layers <laughs> of the reality matrix. And we're only, we're only novices at the, at the very beginning of finding out that we're even in one. Absolutely. You know, and I think you brought it to a beautiful close. This has been a lot of fun, Gerald. It has been. Yeah, yeah. We've been talking shop. Well, you know, we don't we don't agree on everything, but we're brothers and we see that we're going the same place. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. But I just can't see you standing in front of a volcano going, I have goosebumps, people. <laughs> yeah, I don't have it. I'll have to work on uh, I'm a little bit more of an engineer than an actor like Woody Harrelson. But uh, <laughs> but I truly, you know, if I'm on the radio when it's happening, I'm sure not going to put the radio down and go for a run. There you go. Try to get away from it. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> Here it comes. All right. Yeah, I, I just hope everybody hears both of us tell them, listen, you're infinite beings. You can make pragmatic decisions based on the resources you have, and it's good to do that. But the creator of all may have given uh, you just enough resources where all you have to do is step out of and miss the tree, and that's enough, and some ascension window will be offered. You just don't know. So I would say just temper your fear a little bit because it could make you vulnerable to the enslavement carrots and sticks like Marshall was talking about. So don't be easy prey for them. Amen to that. 
Amen to that. Once again, Gerald, thank you so much, and I look forward to the next time. All right, brother. Let's do it again. Thanks. I think Harrington, being an honest guy, would probably have given him an accurate estimation when he spoke. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, come on. He had a telescope specially designed and sent to New Zealand. He was looking for this thing, published a paper. Oh, I know. No. And you go back there. We had an article on our site about mainstream media coverage. And frankly, between you and me, what got that poor man killed was an afterthought in Sitchin's video at the very end of the video because you could see where a producer, this information came in just like a tail end Charlie and said, ooh, 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 too good not to use it, put it in there, where NASA had confirmed what these two guys are really saying in the video. That is, in my opinion, is what took it over the top. They clipped him and then you pointed it out. Mm -hmm. Same on our site. Mm -hmm. Mainstream media coverage right after he was assassinated, boom, it just went off a cliff. Oh, yeah. From 1993 forward, it was silence. Yeah, it was terrible. And uh, not only silent, and then they came out with all of the contra anti Planet X theories. Mm -hmm. You know, you could tell that there was a real nasty cover up. Mm hmm. So, so we got the second number from that interview that was so fantastic. So now we've got a 8.67 billion and 6 billion. I thought. Anyway, you subtract those, you get a delta of 2.01 billion miles. Uh -huh. From that, because we had the time, it was, a, it was approximately nine years, you can calculate the velocity at that point in 1990 was 25,494 miles an hour. Uh-huh. I just told you in the first report I did, when I did the calculations, I came out with 3,170 miles an hour, which would be the average velocity. Okay, and then during the transit, during the middle, when it's in the middle between perihelion and aphelion, it probably travels approximately the average velocity from what most people note about cometary travel. So if you compare that velocity with 25,000 miles per hour, you're talking about an 8x increase from its average velocity to that speed. Well, that would indicate it's starting to experience a gravitational pull from the sun, and it's accelerating. And we know that's what they do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and they either gain enough speed to go into perihelion with the sun and, be, and either escape the sun's pull and so they have to increase their velocity by at least a factor of two beyond what they are right there, or they get pulled into the sun. Right. So the last blink I had was August of 1990 that gave me that number. If we had another number, we could do two things with that. We could update the velocity since 1990, because it certainly didn't slow down. It probably just sped up some more until it gets close. So determining exactly when it'll arrive. When you were looking at, and he was on the perihelion leg where you're analyzing this, what do you think was happening around the semi-minor axis? In other words, the semi-minor axis of that orbit, mm -hmm. halfway point, mm -hmm. in terms of velocity, what do you think on the inbound, mm -hmm. where do you think the velocity were really taking a difference? I believe it probably really started accelerating beyond its average velocity, probably when it got past Pluto, would be my guess. And then by the time it made it to the asteroid, if it make, made it to the asteroid belt, I think it would really start to approach its terminal velocity. And then it, when it gets slung shot around the sun, of course, it's going to be much faster. So when I was playing around with the numbers in my first report, I was guessing if it was to be this fast and to be at 6.6 .6 billion miles away from the sun, just like Harrington showed on his chart, then how long would it take to get here? Well, if it didn't change speed, in my last report, I showed it would take, uh, I think it was 29.4 something years. Right. Well, if you add that to 1990, it lands you at uh, 2019. Right. 
Well, you and I both know <laughs> that it's going to speed up some more. So, oh well, yeah, pedal to pedal. The really missing link of you know adjusting a, a small window. It could get smaller, but it was still small enough where I think you and I both realize it's real. We probably ought to be doing something. Absolutely, and there's something always in the back of my mind. What tells us with absolute certainty? Because this is an object such as we've never seen in the skies, at least not in our memory, in our history. I mean, it's well documented in the Colburn Bible and elsewhere. Sure. But always in the back of my mind is, where does it say it has data from a scientific instrument? Mm -hmm. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So I'm going to synthesize that. And I, and I did that. Well, starting with uh, Dr. Harrington's work, um, the most impressive point in history to me was when the author, Zechariah Sitchin, went to the United States Naval Observatory uh, with a video crew, and apparently with Harrington's cooperation, Dr. Harrington, and him being the chief observer, uh, uh, scientist at the Naval Observatory, this was a pretty big uh, encounter, especially the kind of stuff they were talking about. We know in 1981, Harrington and Neugebauer, the two key figures when data was released about possibly finding the Nibiru complex or Planet X or whatever you want to call it, um, using the infrared astronomical scope. So that was in the papers. Uh, and I focused on what Dr. Harrington said there and also what he said when he met with Zechariah Sitchin and what he showed us. So it's just as important what he showed us as what he said. So let's just summarize what happened. In 1981 in the paper, this, these scientists who apparently didn't have a bridle on their mouths were, were releasing information about data from, an, from this astronomical scope that was commissioned to find something for since the turn of the century, which is the perturber of Neptune and Uranus. And we have scientific evidence that this is not just a theory, it actually is happening. So using that, in 1981, Dr. Harrington said something that contradicted what Dr. Neugebauer said, and he said, I believe it's 5 billion miles outside of Pluto, whereas Dr. Neugebauer said, and he was at JPL and Caltech on the West Coast, said, I believe it's 50 billion miles away and it's not going anywhere. So he was, he was tapping out the fear. I mean, unless he had a blink test, how could he say that, first of all? you know, that it's not moving. So I, I saw some disparities in the data they were reporting, and it really made my hackles go up a little bit. I realized that after 93, with Harrington dead, he had his mouth shut. I think Harrington was assassinated after he did that interview with Sitchin. That's my personal feeling. He crossed the line. I agree. I agree. So anyway, but he gave us two pieces of important data that I think he was trying to release without doing it obviously. Well, the first one that showed up in the paper, and you know after that, it, everything went silent. Well, in 1990, on August 30th of 1990, he met with Sitchin and did this video that's still on my YouTube playlist today. I can't believe it's still up. Not that I'm inviting anyone to take it down, but, <laughs> but uh, what he showed us in there was an orbital chart where he thought Nibiru was coincident with where, New, where Zechariah Sitchin was. So they were there to confer about exactly what we're talking about right now, is where's the damn thing and when's it coming in? Well, based on that meeting, um, he showed us this chart. And with a little simple linear analysis, if you assume the chart was to scale, it turned out to be 6.6 .6 billion miles uh, from the sun, which is 3. Uh, something billion miles outside of Pluto. Well, this is less than what he said before. Okay, so I ended up with two numbers, decided to do my own blink test, and then compare it with the mathematics where I was playing around in a Nibiru orbital report I did last year, because I ended up with a table that approximated when it should arrive based on some scalar factors on the velocity. So this, this second show that, I, that I'm just talking to you about um, I decided to take those blink points and then see what that velocity was, which actually quite shocked me. So I had something to compare it with because we, if we assumed 50 billion miles for aphelion and we knew it was in 1,800 miles in and out, according to the Sumerian records, then we had a, we had a long axis 
where we could calculate the distance equals rate times time. So the average velocity, if you do that, comes out to 3,170 miles per hour. That's point to point, perihelion, or aphelion to perihelion, okay? But we know quite well that comets don't travel that way. They don't travel one velocity. The velocity out uh, toward its binary star is going to be much slower than it is when it gets to the uh, inner sun. And we know, so, so depending on the mass, and a few other factors, you can determine how fast it would be traveling based on its elliptical orbit. But there's so, there's so many parameters that it ends up being guesswork. And I tried to do this in a uh, report where I looked at a, a scientific report that had used the classic Newtonian equations for you know the tetherball theory of gravity and the big G and the little g and calculate this. And this is Marshall Masters for Yowza.com. That's Y-O-W-U-S-A.com. And today we're going to cut to the chase with Gerald Clark. Suddenly I opened my eyes And I saw through the world disguise And is it a curse of difference Between the lies and the truth And are you afraid Well, hey there, Yowza subscribers and listeners at large. Today we're going to have a fun interview with Gerald Clark, and he's another Planet X researcher, author of several books on the Anunnaki, and we're going to talk shop. Now, for those of you who are novices, I'd suggest you start off with my Planet X 101 series to come up to speed, because this will be a little more of an advanced conversation. But for you old salty dogs out there, Folks that been to a county fair and heck even once made it to the county seat, yeah, you're just going to love it because we're going to get into the big question. I call it the frogs, you know, the folks that sit there and go, when, when, when. <laughs> and he posted a video on YouTube and I think it's really great. He did a superb analysis of the Harrington orbit as it appears in the 1992 documentary with Zachariah Sitchin, Are We Alone in the Universe? That was a monumental documentary. It had a huge impact on the lives of both men. And then we're going to talk about what we think about the Anunnaki and about surviving what is to come. Along the way, I'm also going to talk about survival relocation specifically for those of you who are paralyzed. You're like the proverbial deer in the headlights. You just can't bust a move for one reason or another. Many of you just think, well, it's hopeless. If I can't afford beans, bullets, and bunkers, what am I supposed to do? Well, what you don't understand is that you already possess the most valuable survival tool of all. It's so valuable that the elites have gone to great lengths to program you and your loved ones for failure. And if you decide to take back your personal power as a human being and an individual, from that point on, you will have hope for the future as you take small, considered steps in the right direction. So with that, let's get into it with Gerald Clark. Get a job, pay your taxes, pay your dues. This is Marshall, and I'm on with Gerald Clark. And Gerald, welcome to Cut to the Chase. It's really great to be here, Marshall. A uh, warm welcome to you and all your listening audience. And the same to your listening audience. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you're very much welcome. And so we're a couple of guys, and we have the same interest in the same topic. And what I want to start off with is a video you put up on May 31st, 2016, titled Nibiru and Earth Changes Updates, Are We Close? with Gerald Clark, which has done pretty well and seems to have a good ratio of thumbs up to thumbs down. This was something that came to my attention vis-a-vis -vis my audience, and they were really impressed with your analysis of the timing on all of this. So 
Why don't you just summarize that and then let's get into an analysis of the findings. Okay. Well, I know how familiar you are with uh, Dr. Harrington's work. And I was very familiar with it too. In my first book, when I wrote the Anunnaki of Nibiru in 2013, I used some past transit dates as a historical reference point and projected slightly forward, said, well, it's not anywhere close. So I didn't, I didn't really spend much attention on it because I was so focused on what the Anunnaki did in terms of our genetic enslavement that I didn't get too concerned so much about, well, <laughs> where's Nibiru right now? Well, after time, a lot of people kept bringing this up. And I got drawn into doing an analysis. And I, and I thought to myself, well, where would I start? Well, as a scientist, I'm going to start the best I can with data. But I'm also going to take into account cultural occurrences, things from history. But I'm not going to defer to them over actual... has to follow our rules of physics. Well, <laughs> that's a very good question. Imagine they had used some sort of device around their planet to shield radiation when they got in close, maybe even a Dyson sphere so they could control its visibility in, in different wavelengths. Who knows? Bob Dean brought up that mm -hmm. as a possibility. That's where he did that in 2008, I think, in an interview. And uh, that could be, you know, a game changer and everything. But on the other hand, and you're right, Kozai mechanism tells us that anything in a bizarre orbit like this is going to either be flung out into deep space or it is going to slam into the sun. And we're looking at 3979, which according to Nostradamus is when the sun is just going to completely roast the earth and that's the end of life on the earth. Mm. And we've seen this with major comets where on the way out on their apihelion legs passing by Jupiter, that their orbital durations are dramatically shortened. Hale Bopp was a classic, was a 40% reduction. It's a big difference. So I actually looked at, I was looking at one comet trying to figure this out, you know, how fast do they travel at aphelion, how travel, how, you know, as they circle around, how, how fast at perihelion. And I saw factors of up to 20x difference. Yeah. So I didn't feel uncomfortable about using a scalar factor of approximately eight, which brought us in. If you So between seven and eight, it landed between 2015 and 2017, about the middle of 2015. It was like halfway through the year. So that's what I put in my report. I was like, the best I can do until I get more data. In going through that, I thought you did a really good job on, you know, taking into account all the variables and the assumptions. Oh, I face it. You know, you and I, we're like little mice. We feed on the crumbs that fall off the table. I know. And I feel like that sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's so heavily controlled. You know, the first law of Nibiru research, anything good disappears fast. <laughs> That's the way it goes. But your calculation in 2017, in 2008, Bob Dean, and I've spoken with Bob Dean not long after that. And we had a conversation I confirmed with him, and we talked about how he came across the information. But he was saying, 2017, take it to the bank. Well, I had officially the end of 2016. But the last number I saw, one of my subscribers ran through the math, went and looked back in 1981 to see if he could get a, you know, a more monthly refinement instead of just a yearly refinement. And he did that, and, he, and it ended up moving it out to the first quarter of 2017. It was 2017.25, so it was a quarter of uh, the first part of the year. Now, you know, when you're down to this level of playing with fractions, I'm not sure we want to wallow in uh, finding out exactly what day it shows up. I think uh, <laughs> determining how we as um, primitive workers on this planet caught up in a holographic reality are going to respond to the simulator masters is really what's on my mind. <laughs> so I think we're going to do that in the third segment, but uh, we're just kind of going over the data right now. But uh, So there it is. And the other thing I wanted to throw in on this uh, Harrington report, Apparently, when he went to Black Birch, New Zealand, to get this data point, right after meeting with Sitchin, you know, he went down there in 1991, 
He had an eight-inch scope. Only an eight-inch scope. Think about that. An eight-inch scope. I had an eight-inch, you know, a Schmidt cast scope. Uh huh. Barely, you know, make out artifices on the moon really well. So he was using this to look at something coming in, what he believed to be in the constellation Libra from nearly the Antarctic in, in New Zealand. That's right. Well, I found out in one of his reports, he wasn't there to get a, just another blink point. He was looking for its location to get a visual on it so that he could adjust its inbound path. So if you have two points, you can get the velocity. If three, you can kind of draw the, the arc of the elliptical curve. And I think that's what he was there for. I agree. Just think about this, Marshall. If he was there with that small of a scope, and he was down looking in the south where the IRS data pointed that it was coming. And he told Sitchin he thought it was coming in through Libra. Right. Well, if he was down there looking to the south with his small scope, if he was able to get something that corroborated his, uh, and it didn't come out in the window that I thought was acceptable, but I thought it was great work. Okay. So these two blink points, when I used them, I started out with 5 billion miles outside of Pluto, which is 8.67 billion miles. And then uh, in 1990, August, with Sitchin, he showed us this chart. And like I told you, it looked like it was 6.6 .6 billion miles, if that chart was to scale. And I believe it was. What's your opinion on that, uh, Marshall? You've seen that diagram multiple times. I know you have. Did, you, did it ever occur to you to ask, is it to scale? That's always a good question. You don't see a scale there. But interestingly enough, Carlos Ferrada the astronomer who first announced Nibiru back in 1940. Mm -hmm. I've read his work. Paired a similar diagram, and it was pretty much in line with each other. Yeah, I, I did not do a linear analysis on his chart, even though I just saw it recently. But he actually published what he said the Herculobus aphelion distance was, and he believed it was 32 billion miles. In the big scheme of things, it's not that far off if it was truly at 50 billion. Maybe it was one of the planets in Nibiru that was at 32 while it was at 50, and it's hard to say. It is really, really hard to say. I mean, for me, when I look at all of this, I see a comet-like orbit. There's a plate that the Sumerians did. And you look at that, and what the Sumerians are showing you is the things inclined 10 degrees to the ecliptic. So there's quite a bit you can piece together with it. But I guess for me, it really comes down to what's happening to our sun, what's happening to our planet. Mm -hmm. That drives my work more than anything else. I liked your analysis and how you were breaking it down. Do you want me to finish it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I like the way you broke it down in that video. Yeah. Well, so I ended up with these two blink points that I really wanted people to think about and decide, you know, that's where the truth is or a lie is. And we can't truly know that unless you had access to what Neugebauer and Harrington were seeing directly. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I had to somewhat operate on faith that Harrington was telling the truth. And from what I could tell, and reading his papers and knowing lots of scientists. I spent years in that space. He seemed like an honorable guy to me. And, and a lot of times that's the best you can do and then see if the data resonates true with you with a lot of uh, trust and verify, right? Well, I'll tell you, I've talked to whistleblowers that had met him and knew him. They said the guy was the real deal. Mm -hmm. As far as they were concerned, they clipped him. Well, I don't think Sitchin would have gone to him unless he'd have believed he was the real deal. I had a chance to work with Sitchin a few times when he was alive, and that man dotted his I's and crossed his T's. We did an article in 2003. I know. I heard your discussion of that. He was amazingly detailed for anybody to be picking him apart academically from the couch, <laughs> not in the arena like he was. Wow. Oh, man. And, you know, Lloyd Pye, as far as I'm concerned, said it better than just about any of his defense of Sitchin. And you brought that up in one of your videos. I actually had it on my website for a while. Uh huh. But the reality is he's in 23 plus different languages. Uh, his stuff's all over the world. And it's been out since 1976. And people have 
stood on his shoulders to get to where they are. So to kick a man that's dead as a hero to try to puff yourself up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say you and I are standing on his shoulders. Definitely. And I gave him acknowledgement in my book for doing that. You know, whether he was completely right or wrong on everything, nobody's right on everything. I agree. You know, it's not about being right. It's about getting it right. If you do it with integrity, eventually you'll get there. I absolutely agree, you know. But I see folks coming in and publishing in the field, and they just have all kinds of self-interested agendas. They're really not interested in doing good science or trying to do good science. And that makes them pretty dangerous people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to close out this number part so we can move on to... Yeah, let's do that. So we have two numbers. One back in um, 1981 when it was released, which is 8.67 billion miles. That's how far Harrington said it was at that time. Now, right. There was some variability possibly in which month that data was derived in anticipation of that news article released it. I don't know what that time frame is. Uh, one of my subscribers thinks it was three months, but I have no way. I don't really know. Right. So getting the data from the satellite and then getting it to the newspaper, 